but first, before I, I turn it over to our, our speakers, I really want to say thank you all for being here. For those of you who have been involved in um, social services in our community for a long period of time, you probably remember when we used to host the Human Services Information Network meeting pretty regularly. Um, and then shortly before Hurricane Ian hit our community, um, we had kind of pressed pause because we were going to kind of evaluate, you know, the, the meetings and, and how we wanted to schedule them and structure them. But then Ian occurred, right? And everything kind of took a back burner to all the amazing recovery work and um, relief work that so many of you were, were doing. But now that we're into 2024, we've heard from a lot of partners the need to bring back this community meeting and really allow an opportunity for everyone to share what they're doing, to interact with one another, to meet new partners. You know, there's been a lot of movement across the network um, the last few years. And so just an opportunity to kind of make those connections. And, um, you know, we felt like the time was now, you know, last month we we partnered with American Red Cross and did a disaster focused uh, meeting. And we're kind of continuing that theme a little bit today, um, but we kind of used that as the, the final push that was needed to relaunch the Human Services Information Network meeting. And so we're still calling it HISN. It's a mouthful, I know. Maybe we'll rebrand it later this year, but as many of you know, we're still in the midst of fund distribution, so we just haven't been able to take a breath and say, what can we call this meeting that's not just alphabet soup, right? Um, but still makes sense and, and gets across what we're trying to do. And so um, for those of you who are new to the HISA meetings, who have never attended before, I hope that you, you take away you know, the, the fact that these meetings are here to provide the network um, educational opportunities. We will always have a speaker. Um, we try to look for relevant topics that really benefit the network as a whole. And then we are going to still incorporate that report out. So if you remember when we did this in person, you know, you would have the opportunity to stand up. Well, we're not well, you could stand up, I guess, in front of your computer. That's probably healthier than what I'm doing right now. But, you know, you will have the opportunity to raise your hand and report out very briefly to the network. You know, if there's an agency update, like I said, I know we've had a lot of staffing changes. So if there's somebody who wants to introduce themselves to the network in their new roles, or maybe your organization is launching a new program, um, we'll be able to kind of do um, like soundbite uh, report out, if you will. And then at the very tail end, I'm going to get kind of experimental here. So you're going to have to bear with me. This could either work wonderfully or it can go down in flames and we'll never do it again. But I'm going to do randomized breakout sessions. Um, so at the very end of, you know, after we get through um, the, the meat of this meeting, so to speak, I will um, open up some breakout rooms and I'll explain it a little bit more in detail when we get there, but that'll be a place for more informal discussions. OK, so you'll be able to talk about challenges or if, you know, if anything's coming up, particularly for the summer at your agency or just share resources and just meet one another. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Like I said, um, Give me some leeway because it is the first time we're doing anything like that in, on this scale. Um, so we'll see how that how that works out. But you know, today we really felt that we all know what you know time of year it is. What's what's kind of creeping up on us. And even this morning, I'm sure a lot of you turned on the news and you saw that 10% chance, right, of that little system out there in the ocean. Um, we're coming up fast on storm season. And so we really wanted to kind of focus on that today with our, our speakers. You're going to hear from Benjamin Ames um, from Lee County Government. You will also hear from a couple of our partners at American Red Cross. And so we're really excited to share, you know, their perspectives and, and their um, resources with you. But I wanted to take just a, a moment to talk about United Way's role in disaster and response and, and how um, we kind of help with the network. Um, a lot of people have asked me about that, you know, as we're leading up into storm season. So I think this would probably be a good opportunity since I have a captive audience here to, to share that. Um, but, you know, we work very closely with Lee County Government and Emergency Management. We serve essentially the role of the um, Emergency Support Function 15, uh, which basically means that we help coordinate 
donations and volunteers. So when we have all those spontaneous volunteers coming in or groups coming from different parts of the country, we're able to, to be that point of contact for them to get them to all the great organizations, all of your great organizations that are doing the work. And so, you know, we can point them in, in the right direction. So you're not having to facilitate all those spontaneous volunteer calls um, saying, can I come to your organization? What can I do? What do I need to bring? You know, we can kind of filter them that for you. We also would run the volunteer reception center, which would be the physical place that they can come or we do an online one like we did with um, Ian, we did a hybrid. Um, the donations, many of you were the recipients of a lot of those disaster donations that were coming into our community. Um, you work with our staff to see if you have the capacity to take them in, either to serve your clients or to run your own points of distribution. Um, so we have that partnership. We get to sit within the, the EOC and, and field those calls as they're coming in. We will also, what's new um, for any future disasters, we will be doing a daily call out, um, not only for our agencies, but we'll also do one for the faith-based community. I know some of you um, are part of that faith-based network. So if we have not connected with you, I'd love to get you on our communication list, um, just to see how we can support you um, during times of a disaster. And then um, we also, which is a, a very long-standing partnership we operate the storm or disaster information hotline um, so we our 211 staff actually physically moves into the emergency operations center and we take all those calls anything from you know what do i need to bring with me to a shelter at to where is you know when is my power coming back on and so um you know when it comes to disasters we are here for our network of partners just like we are year round um, we are here to help you to support you in the work you're doing so please you know it's good to say this during blue skies but whenever the the opportunity arises um you know please reach out to us with your needs angela and tina will always be those points of contact to kind of be your concierge and get you in touch with the right department um to to serve you and so i just wanted to put that out there and take a few minutes i am wearing my lee county eoc shirt ben so i kind of addressed um the, the role today but as i mentioned um, ben aves is joining us he is the director of public safety and gets to oversee all the amazing um, emergency management work that that gets done and among other things <laughs> um, so Ben I would love to have you um, take the reins and introduce yourself to the group awesome well good afternoon everyone and thank you again for the invitation my name is Ben Abus I'm uh, as Madison said director of public safety for Lee County uh, in Lee County the uh, Department of Public Safety includes emergency management as well as the county's emergency medical services our emergency communication center, which handles a uh, majority of the fire and EMS uh, 911 calls and dispatching services. Uh, we also have a uh, technology uh, branch. We have a logistics and finance uh, support and our administrative team that works currently out of our offices downtown. Uh, but next year, we're very excited to be moving into the expanded footprint at the Public Safety Center on Ortiz, uh, which is currently under construction and it's hard to believe it's actually happening, but uh, I have seen the walls that are up. Uh, it really is happening. So I really appreciate the opportunity to jump on the call and to, to talk for a couple of minutes. Is it all right, uh, Madison, if I just jump in? Absolutely, please. Perfect. So um, I have a couple of slides here. And it is hopefully loading. There we go. All right, so um, I wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about hurricane season preparedness, and especially in the lens of the work that you all do as part of, uh, you know, really the, the glue that holds a lot of our neighborhoods and communities together. Um, and I'll talk about uh, organizational preparedness as well as uh, some of the things that you can do individually to make sure that you and your family are prepared. Um, so you might ask, like, why why is this even important? Well, we recognize at Lee County government that in blue skies and gray, our community's nonprofits are really the main conduit for a lot of people that need help 
And when they need it the most, they are looking at the people that are in their neighborhoods, in their communities. And that is a lot of our nonprofit partners that are on the call today. Uh, I would love to think that local government can solve all of the world's problems. That is very unlikely. And really, it's the people that are embedded in those neighborhoods, uh, like those of you on the call today, that are really doing uh, the most important work, which is really kind of the one-on-one -on -one work and delivering those direct services. And so when something bad happens in our community, like a hurricane or a fire or a tornado, um, we can certainly provide some things, um, but a lot of those people in those communities look right back at those nonprofits that they know and trust in their in their neighborhood, and you are the ones that that are there to, to frequently answer that call. Um, and so this connection is very important to us. As Madison said, we do a lot of things with the United Way in the Emergency Operations Center, but we do all of those things recognizing that the reach of the United Way and the network of nonprofits that are out there in the community is so wide and vast that connecting with one agency really means that we're connecting with hundreds of partners across the community. So again, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to talk about this today. It really is core and, and central to our mission to getting help to the people that need it the most. I have a couple of slides and the, I'm, I'm very much a less is more person, but as I started to work on these slides, there was so much information. So there's a lot of words, but I'll, I'll go through it. And I think it's really important to, to touch on a couple of things. So as we're talking about planning for essential operations, um, one of the, the terms that we frequently throw out is this idea of continuity of operations plans or COOP plans. And these are, are basically plans that say, if some component of our work is disrupted, how are we gonna continue to do the important work that we do? Um, and it's not just hurricanes, it could be any natural or man-made man disaster or emergency. So for example, while this plan could be used in the case of a hurricane, um, let's say that there was a, a fire that occurred that disrupted your normal business operations. Well, a continuity of operations plan can help you by answering some of those key questions. And we'll talk about kind of the six focus areas in just a second, but uh, part of this process is to identify what risks you're susceptible to. So we know in our community, you know, we have wildfires, we have the potential for tornadoes, and of course, we have the potential for tropical weather. There's a lot of other emergencies and things that occur. You can also include in there like loss of technology. Maybe the services that you deliver are highly reliant on having connectivity to the internet. Um, I'll give you an example. This morning, there was a sporadic Verizon outage that occurred uh, across the Southeast United States. We happen to have about 700 devices that are connected to Verizon that are running parts of our public safety operations. And so we have backup plans as part of our continuity of operations plans to switch over to other carriers that are up when we have a Verizon disruption. So it could be as simple as, hey, we, we normally use this provider and, and today there's a disruption and so we have to use another resource. As you go through and identify what those risks are, then you can start to, to answer some, some important questions like, what would the actual impact be to our operations? What would we not be able to do? Are there any easy workarounds or alternatives? Like, you know, when the internet is down at home, I start tethering devices to my phone. I can, I can immediately fix that issue. So it may be as simple as just finding simple workarounds or, or alternatives. Um, can we look to plan uh, one of those alternatives or partner with somebody to, to help to continue to achieve our goals and the services that we provide out in, into the community. And then finally talking about how we would restore normal services. Is there a process, once you go to your emergency backup, is there a process you need to undertake to restore those normal services and get back into the normal mode of operation that you enjoy on a day-to-day -day basis? And in a major disaster, I think one of the other questions, and this is something that we saw, I mean, there's hundreds of examples across the community after Hurricane Ian, in what ways can you contribute to the needs of the community that might be different than what you do on a normal blue sky day? You all are doing amazing work every day, but not all of you are providing food and drinking water to the community. Not all of you are helping people with FEMA applications for, for disaster assistance. But there's a lot of things that nonprofits in our community jump in and, and step in to help those communities do those tasks or provide those commodities. And through that process, you help to 
extend the reach of public safety, emergency management, and all of the other groups in the community, you're really providing the, the, the assistance in the neighborhood where it counts the most. So I think that's an important question to ask as well is, once we're planned and we're ready to be robust enough to withstand the storm or withstand whatever that disaster is, how else can we contribute to the needs of the community? As you're thinking about this, there's kind of six core ways uh, that you can, you can think about how you should plan for some of these essential operations that could be disrupted due to one of these emergencies. So the first would be staff. And we'll talk just a second about personal preparedness, but that includes planning and preparedness activities for the protection of your staff, both protection of your staff in the workplace, but also how are staff preparing themselves so that they can be ready to fulfill their role as part of your organization. Uh, secondly, surroundings. What are the things that are around you that pose a threat? We uh, Today, we've been doing a, a bunch of media interviews in advance of hurricane season. And one of the things that we constantly talk about is securing your home and getting loose items up from around your property when a storm is approaching because they can become projectiles in the wind. So what are the things that, that potentially pose a threat and can you secure them or in, in some way protect yourself and others from, from those hazards? Um, third is space, and that includes the contents of your workspace, uh, you know, everything that is there. Um, one of the lessons that we saw down on Fort Myers Beach is a number of businesses were really relying on everything that they had in their business on Fort Myers Beach or in some of these areas that were impacted by storm surge. Well, if that information is not backed up somewhere or you don't have redundant systems somewhere, then a lot of that stuff can be lost very, very quickly. Uh, that also includes making sure that you have documentation of all of that uh, material and all of the contents for any insurance claims that may follow one of these uh, emergencies or a disaster. The systems include, you know, different systems that support the operation of the buildings or your drinking water, power, uh, technology, any other essential systems that are that are uh, rely reliant on or your operations are reliant on to be able to uh, provide the services that you do in the community. Um, and again, power, potable drinking water, wastewater, technology, those are all types of systems that you should be thinking about and planning for. Of course, the structure that you're operating in, um, you know, the ability to improve structural elements uh, requires a lot of money, and we realize that. But understanding some of those weaknesses is also very important because some of that you may be able to pre-plan. If you know that the roof is highly vulnerable, we probably need to have more robust plans to be able to do our operations out of temporary facilities or maybe a partner agency that's nearby. These are all things that you can discuss internally and with your network of, of nonprofit partners that are here as, as part of HISN. And then finally, service, which includes your own operations and opportunities for you to engage with the community following an event. Again, we, we love the idea that you immediately recover and continue to provide those important services in the community. But we also ask you to consider what other services can you do to help recover the community as quickly as possible. Uh, and it's a, just an extension of the great work that that all of these partner agencies do uh, day in and day out. Now, I, I cannot speak about hurricane preparedness without talking about personal preparedness as well. And so I do want to spend a minute to talk about really the three simple steps that we ask you and your family to do to prepare yourselves for uh, a potential storm. And, you know, there's been a lot of focus on the uh, potential forecast for this year. It doesn't matter if there was one storm or 20. If we are impacted by a hurricane, you will need to have a plan and you will need to be ready to do these simple steps to make sure that you are ready. So. You know, I, I like to say that the forecast really doesn't matter because we need to have a plan each and every year. If there is one storm or 20 storms and they impact the community, we have to have a plan. So those three simple steps start with having that family emergency plan and an emergency supply kit. That includes, um, you know, a kit that has drinking water, food, medications, anything that you might need for an extended duration and, and needing to leave your home or your business urgently. There's a disaster preparedness tax holiday that's coming up June 1st to June 14th. It's a great opportunity to go through your plan, look through the contents and make sure that everything is up to date and you've got exactly what you need. Uh, one, people always ask me like, what, what, what's not on the list that we need to think about? 
And one of the things that has come up this year is battery chargers for your cell phone and your mobile devices. If the power is out for an extended duration, but you can get a charge for a couple extra days off of one of those batteries, it's a great purchase. And again, with that disaster tax uh, uh, holiday coming up, that's a great chance to do it without paying the sales tax on that item as well. Secondly, um, as part of this, you need to have a family emergency plan. And you know, one of the things that has really shifted since Hurricane Irma in 2017 is this idea that as part of that plan, you need to know exactly where you're going to go. But your plan doesn't have to be that we're going to evacuate to Indiana. You can just simply evacuate five or 10 miles away out of the evacuation zone and you're very safe. A lot of the traffic and the congestion and the concerns about how long it takes to evacuate is based on everyone moving at once out of those areas a great distance. It's very simple. Find a friend, a family member, a coworker, somebody that lives outside of those evacuation areas and pre-plan it. Know that, hey, you know, my friend is, is in this part of town. They are outside of these evacuation zones and I've talked to them and I'm going to bring, uh, you know, our food and water so as not to put a burden on them. And we're going to go stay with them for a couple of days while the storm passes. Um, we want people to do those plans because that reduces the reliance on public shelters. The county will always provide public shelters, but if you can, you really don't want to be in one of those public shelters. Have a plan and have a place to go. Secondly, you need to know your evacuation and your flood zone, and you need to know a little bit about your home as well. So your evacuation and your flood zone is important because when we call for evacuations, we're going to identify those evacuations by the evacuation zone. And so when we call out zone A or zone B, you know, need to know uh, which zone you're in uh, so that you know whether your zone is being evacuated or not. And as part of this, knowing your home is also very important because if your home was built after about 2002, when some of the newer uh, building codes were put into effect, most of those homes are going to make it through a significant hurricane without wind damage. You may lose portions of your roof, some shingles and whatnot, um, but you're not going to have a structural compromise because of the building codes that were in effect. So knowing your home and its capabilities is very important. But the thing to remember is that even if your home was built to the strictest building codes and standards, if we call for an evacuation of your neighborhood, it's generally due to storm surge and you still need to evacuate. Even if your home is secure, you're still at risk of exposure to storm surge. And finally, you need to be alert and be ready as weather approaches. One of the things that we heard after Ian was that people waited until evacuation orders were issued to be able to evacuate, uh, or excuse me, to, to activate their plans and start their preparations. Well, the time to start the preparations, it's not when the system is 10% off of Africa. It's the time to start your preparations is about two or three days out when, when it's close, we're within the cone, you know, there's enough concern that, that, you know, we need to start doing some of those preparations. We're not quite evacuating, but we're doing things like pulling up the loose items around our home and, and securing them. We're, we're thinking about putting up our storm shutters and taking those first steps to make sure that our, our home is secured. Uh, we're securing documents, our insurance policies, and other things that you need to have at hand. Doing all of those things to make sure that when an evacuation is called for, you're ready to evacuate. There were a lot of people that thought that they could spend all day Tuesday before Wednesday's landfall of Ian. They could spend all day Tuesday preparing and they would just evacuate on Wednesday. But at that point it was too late. So you really need to have those steps in place two or three days out and then be ready to evacuate when an evacuation order is called for. There's a couple of really great tools that we have on our website. Uh, and these are three QR codes and I can send the links over as well. Um, the first on the left is the resident information tool. This is really cool. You type in your address and you can even do this for your business as well. It will tell you your evacuation zone. It will tell you your flood zone. It will provide you with a link to all of the shelters. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of information on that. You can learn your, the days for your trash pickup. Um, if you're new to the area or even if you've been here for a while, a wealth of information in the resident information tool. Of course, the all hazards guide that we publish every year. Um, that all hazards guide has everything from the map of where the shelters are to checklists and other tools that you can use to build both your emergency plan as well as your emergency supply kit. 
And then finally, we have a, a page that has all of the resources, the All Hazards Guide, um, our Lee Prepares app, our uh, Alert Lee website for alerting, all of these resources that you could potentially need ahead of hurricane season are all located on one page, and that page is leegov.com slash hurricane, or you can use the QR code that's on the screen. Um, that page is fantastic because everything that you could possibly need to find on our website is in one spot. Uh, and so I have uh, definitely taken up my 20 minutes. Um, I can't thank you all enough for being on the call today and for the great work that you do in our communities. And I can't thank the United Way enough for the opportunity to, to share some of this messaging today. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And I think we have we have time to take maybe just um, a couple a couple questions. If anyone has, look at all of these um, clapping emojis. <laughs> That's excellent. I love that. Um, maybe if we could unshare the screen and then we can just see if anybody would like to raise their hand. Um, and for those of you unfamiliar with Teams, that is in the the middle of kind of that bar at the top there. Um, does anybody have a question for Ben? Okay, we have one from Lisa. Lisa, are you able to unmute? Oh, she brought it back down. So maybe she was just trying to, to see how that worked. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Ben, for that very thorough presentation. That was excellent. We appreciate your time. I, I, I know you were um, running from the, the courthouse, <laughs> so we appreciate it. My pleasure. So, Thanks again. I would like to introduce our, our second speaker today. We are going to hear from Miguel Hidalgo from American Red Cross. Miguel? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Ah, there we go. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm the, the South Florida Regional Recovery Manager uh, for the American Red Cross. And I think uh, a good way to start is to explain a little bit about our program and what it is that we do uh, on a day to day basis, you know, and then we can expand that to to when we go into an activation um, when we're working collaboratively with the EOC and, and United Way, of course. And um, so I have a few slides I think I like to share just to go over. Great. Can you all see that? Uh, can you see the slide there? Or I'll make it a little bit bigger. Miguel, you're just on in presentation view. Okay. Yeah, but I think I, I want to skip on on a different slide on the side, just to. Is that okay? Is that? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna skip around a little bit. That looks good. Yeah. Is that? I'll just make it a little bit bigger. Okay. There we go. Well, yes, I was saying, you know, um, we cover South Florida pretty much from the Fort Myers area to the Keys. Um, and we render what we call individual disaster care services um, from disaster mental health to disaster health services uh, to disaster spiritual care uh, to integrated condolence care team. That's a combination of, of the services uh, when we have a fatality. Um, from a fire or other, you know, uh, tragic event in, in our communities. Uh, these are all volunteers that are comprised of different teams that they're licensed and specialized in these areas. Uh, and this, we also have then a casework team uh, to continue that recovery process for, for our clients. Um, again, when there's that fire or that event that um, pretty much made them lose their home, um, they have all, you know, we want to really try to meet their needs as much as possible, uh, their immediate needs, uh, because we do more of a short-term recovery for them. Uh, but we're out there, you know, on a daily basis, pretty much, uh, responding to what we call level ones, level one responses. Uh, when the fire rescues gives us the call, the notification that a fire has gone out, our teams go out and um, respond. Uh, we call them disaster action teams. And then there's the recovery piece of it, the support services um, uh, that are the ones listed here for all the clients that, that we get. 
OK, and then we also have a compliance unit uh, that do case reviews also. They, they make sure that um, all the information captured uh, from the clients uh, during the event is, is accurate and um, you know that, that all information can be relied on so we can continue the casework uh, planning and recovery for them. So, you know, that in a nutshell is what we call our individual disaster care services. Uh, we render those, on a, like I said, on a daily basis. Um, you know, events are happening every day almost, uh, and we're ready, you know, standing alert and ready to respond uh, with our teams. Again, from, from Fort Myers to the Keys, uh, all our teams here are regional, so they will follow up with the cases. All the services are regional, so um, we can have somebody from Miami assisting a family in Fort Myers. Um, you know, uh, et cetera. So, so that's kind of our scope, our range. Um, just wanted to introduce that so you guys have a good understanding of kind of what we do. And and pretty much recovery services is what I just explained. It kind of, you know, we minimize intrusion and maximize the care and comfort and support for them. Uh, we go from, you know, single family fires to large numbers, uh, multifamily fires uh, that we also see at times. And also when there's fatalities. Uh, we uh, assist them with um, condolences and even the funeral costs on a case-by-case -case basis uh, for families that um, suffered a fatality during the event. So most of our uh, services are in person or we'll also do virtual. I will call them over the phone uh, to see how they're doing. And we again, you know, we, we offer them all the services uh, that I just listed there in that first slide. Pretty much this is our structure. This is how we look like. Um, we have leads for each of the services. Uh, I, as the manager, of course, uh, make sure that we have leads in place and then those teams report to the leads uh, for, for the different services. Uh, currently, we have some vacancies that we're working on filling, uh, but that's on an ongoing basis. You know, our American Red Cross, you know, 90% of our workforce is volunteers uh, and they do a great job in what they do and respond, like I said, on a daily basis to events happening out there. Not only fires, but it could be a flooding or a car that crashed into a home, et cetera. Uh, we have different classifications uh, for damage assessment to the home. So we'll know what kind of assistance to give uh, a client depending on, on the level of damage to the home um, and the nature of the incident. So disaster health services just explains a little bit what that is. Uh, these are a team of licensed nurses that we have as volunteers also that go out there and assist clients with different uh, medical clinical needs. Yes, uh, from connecting them to medications that they might have uh, a loss to eyeglasses to just connecting them to the to the medical and clinical needs that they had that they might have lost uh, during the fire, uh, especially for seniors uh, and folks who already had pre existing conditions. Uh, we try to address those needs as much as possible uh, with our resources. And we're kind of, we serve as those connectors between the medical community and the nurse uh, who has been assigned to, to the case, to the client. We also do disaster mental health, which is a very important component as well uh, after a disaster, after a tragedy. Uh, and pretty much our, our specialists here, our volunteers, uh, like I said, they're licensed in their areas. Uh, they provide the emotional well-being for for the for the client. Uh, they check up on them and make sure that they're okay after the incident. Uh, if there's any uh, psychological first aid that needs to be rendered, uh, crisis intervention, or any other mental health referrals, if um, the specialist um, you know deems that the, the client needs um, additional mental health um, service after the event. Uh, especially if, uh, again, they suffered a fatality in the family or household, um, they're definitely uh, following up and making sure that the emotional well-being of the client is, is being served. So very important uh, service here as well. And we have a team, again, that's regional um, that um, will follow up with any case that's generated. And then I was saying earlier, you know, we have the ICCT team. Uh, that's made up of, of the health services, uh, mental health, and also spiritual care. Um, those they will get together and form a team and see how best they can meet the needs of, of the family who had a fatality. Uh, unfortunately, there are those cases um, that happen, and and we assist them as much as best with you know compassionate service uh, to them, and also see if we can help them with um, you know funeral or cremation costs. 
depending again case by case, but we all, we do offer that service as well. So that's that's our ICCT team, and we have a lead for for that unit as well. And then of course, it's casework, our caseworkers, which pretty much put it all together. Uh, they make sure that all the services I just described are are rendered, are rendered, and that the the client um, was able to to you know make the best use of them. Okay, that if if there's a need, uh, urgent need that we were not able to meet, that we have the referrals for them, that we connect them to organizations like yourselves uh, to help them meet any other additional needs that they may have. Uh, we remind them that you know uh, we do immediate urgent needs first. Uh, to make sure they have a safe place to go after the fire, especially if they lose their home, um, and get them kind of back on their feet, meet their immediate needs, whether clinical, mental, uh, spiritual, and also, of course, with funds. We we could um, uh, supply them, you know, disperse funds to them to help them get into a hotel, a motel, what have you, for at least a few days so they can, you know, start the recovery process. Um, so we kind of, we really tackle those what we call recovery roadblocks. Uh, whatever they're dealing with in, in their lives. Um, now, probably they had pre-existing conditions. Now it's going to be worsened by, by what just happened. So we work with partner agencies like yourselves uh, to make sure we connect them, okay, if we cannot uh, meet all the needs that they have. So that's what our caseworkers do, and they do a great job at it. Uh, they follow up with the client 24 to 48 hours after the incident or less, and they'll they'll make that connection with the client. And then we have our compliance reviewers, which are a key a unit as well, again, to make sure that the data that we're capturing uh, is accurate and is protected uh, and that we don't have any fraudulent cases um, happening. OK, so that's our compliance unit. And they're also part of the recovery uh, program. And, and that's kind of the, the 11 slides I wanted to show just to just give you an overview of kind of who we are, just a better understanding how we serve the South Florida region. Um, and I'll take any questions if you have um, on, on who we are. Any other questions? Thank you. I'll stop sharing now. Hey, Thank Miguel. You. Miguel, it's, it's Zach. So um, hello, everyone. I'm the, the South Florida uh, Community Engagement Partnerships Manager for the region. Um, one thing I also wanted to add while, while we're on the topic, and Ben kind of went over it, is um, around the resiliency piece, around making sure that your organization uh, is ready to go for whether it's a, a hurricane or a fire or whatever it may be. Um, the Red Cross has a few programs that are designed to to help that piece, both for the community and and for your uh, your own uh, organization, especially your building. Um, we have what we call Ready Rating, which is a preparedness program we have. It's free, um, and it it is around creating. Uh, it's around answering some questions. And that leads to a resiliency plan that um, formulates what you're missing, what you can do to add, and also giving you resources on where you can uh, you can go to to potentially mitigate those those uh, gaps that you have in your plan. So it, it provides you with that ability um, to prepare. Um, and again, it's a free service. It's you know to fill those gaps, you have to potentially. Uh, pay for some things, but it'll allow you to, to see where those gaps are. And then of course, we have our preparedness programs that uh, are centered around getting the community ready to go, as well as, um, you know, your organizations and their their um, um, constituents. So those are a few programs. I think that because Ben touched on, it, I wanted to make sure that we threw it out there that there is a service to the Red Cross to get that plan. Um, and then in, in the sense of like the hurricane, uh, preparedness, you know, we we look at some of our operational pieces to, you know, Miguel talked on a lot of the recovery stuff that goes on during a hurricane, um, our IDC services that is there available for uh, hurricane um, uh, survivors, making sure that that's there for them, as well as first responders uh, and our responders. But we also do our, of course, our, our kind of bread and butter is around our, our shelters, and um, we support our partners with uh, providing mobile feeding and distribution of emergency supplies. And, uh, you know, and then our financial assistance component, which is based off of our damage assessment classifications, uh, where we have our teams going around assessing the homes based off of 
FEMA's uh, structural integrity categories um, that we that FEMA has developed over the years. So utilizing those categories to to ensure that homes who have what we call a major destroyed, um, basically their structures are unlivable. They can be able to um, for, to obtain financial assistance to help them as well as start some of that recovery piece, as you'll see, uh, as we saw in Hurricane Ian and Adalia, where we have our long term recovery teams out making sure and providing that longer term care um, alongside that aspect of potential um, grant opportunities or funding opportunities for different uh, organizations across the board, as I'm sure there are some on, on this call who, who have received some of that grant funding or have worked with the Red Cross in their long term recovery process. Um, you know, in terms of our scale, as Miguel kind of talked about, it, we have the level one, which would be our house fires, but then you have all the way up to level seven, which is where um, you would see the, the hurricane Ian's of, of the world. Uh, and in between those things, that's where we, we scale our, our resources and our responses um, to, to you know, actually to uh, help those folks who have been impacted in there. So a lot of it is based on how much money is spent on an operation, um, but some of that can be dependent on you know, the amount of uh, attention that it has, uh, especially around a mass casualty. Um, those, those factors all go into what that level would be set, but it is predominantly driven by how much damage has been uh, done to an area and how many re how much resources that we would need as an organization to, to um, provide support uh, and then get our boots on the ground uh, to, to make sure we can respond to that. So I just wanted to add that, that little bit. Um, a lot of the services that Miguel talked about um, are, you know, they, they work in coordination um, after we've done kind of the response piece of things um, with the sheltering and the feeding and all that. Um, that's when that recovery team and working to engage our clients and the survivors who uh, are provided financial assistance and then uh, that long term recovery component. So just wanted to add that those pieces to it. And um, Jill, if you could, I don't know if, if you can provide the some contact information. And if anyone is interested in ready rating uh, or if we want to do at a, a future uh, time, we can do it for the crew that's on this phone on the phone call. Um, we can do it. It's not a very long uh, presentation, so we can fit it in in around 25 minutes. That's all I got. Unless there's any questions. Thank you so much, Zach. And I know Astoria, I believe, posted the ready rating um, in the chat. So if anyone is interested, you can um, go ahead and, and click through there. And um, if, you, if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to raise your hand. I know uh, many of you, I see you, Maria, many of you have been um, working um, through our United Way House Network, which is a, a core part of our United Way. And we believe um, these houses really uh, form resiliency here in our community. And you either are leading them or you're offering services through them. And American Red Cross has really um, been a great partner in, in helping us um, identify some areas to fortify and, and build our, our agency network up. So thank you for that. Maria, your question. Thanks, Madison. And thank you, Miguel, for the presentation. A quick note, if you haven't done writing rating, it's, it's a great tool. Um, but my question has to do with if your case managers are chatting with someone, how do we get our agency that might be able to provide resources to you um, so that we're on your um, kind of call list if you happen to have anybody that's impacted that qualifies for our services? Well, yeah, good question, Maria. Good question. Uh, definitely, you know, we have a, a contact referrals list that we continue to expand on. Our caseworkers all have them. Uh, and we would go down that list and we have them, you know, per county, per region uh, of all the not-for-profits that are in the area. So depending on the, the case client, depending on the client, where the client location is, um, we will connect them to that service. So we're constantly want to learn about new organizations and new not-for-profits that are, that are out there so we can include them in their resource tool that the caseworkers have. 
uh, because that's essential, you know, uh, to have the right point of context, the right point of, you know, uh, key folks that you can build relationships with and say, hey, uh, this client needs uh, such and such. You know, they need help with the electric bill uh, or, you know, they need a, a walker or, you know, different kind of things. It, it could be different case by case, you know, uh, on a case by case basis. But if you have those contacts ready to go and they're on your list, you could definitely uh, make that referral and make that connection. Uh, so, Maria, like yourself or any other organizations that please share with us, you know, who you are, what you do, what service you render, uh, and we will definitely include you on that list. Because, like I said, that is um, that is the ultimate tool to have, and our, all our caseworkers are really good. They're kind of subject matter experts in who's where and who has what. You know, from uh, feeding South Florida to to you know food banks to you know, there's a whole host of organizations out there that can assist our clients uh, in terms of meeting again those recovery blocks that that I mentioned earlier. Um, so definitely good question. So I, I think the best answer is you know please. Send me your information, send me your contact information um, with a little description of who you are or a web link to your site or whatever, and then I'll include it on our caseworker list for them to have it, you know, at a fingertip notice, you know, they can just. So thank you. I hope I answered your question. You did. Thank you. And thank you, Jill, for having the contact in the chat. All right, we'll um, take one more from Providence. This is uh, Dr. Cruz calling from uh, Providence Family Life Center. Uh, we are disaster case management and recovery services, and we also uh, provide uh, disaster mental health support for survivors. We were dispatched to uh, the public shelter and medical shelter during Hurricane Ian. And Miguel, the question is for you. I was just trying to understand, is your team the team that uh, sets up in the shelters? Because we worked hand in hand with the groups that were there, and I believe there were some Red Cross staff there, and it was fantastic working with this group. So I just wanted to ID your team if that was in fact you. Thank you. Sure. No. Thank you for for the kind words, and um, it, it's definitely a collaboration. Definitely, um, we do DMH, but you know, disaster mental health. But we collaborate and work together with other disaster mental health um, organizations, and that's kind of how we, you know, collectively, you know, meet the gaps. You know, alone, you know, we our resources are, are to a certain level. Are you know, uh, so definitely yes, we do. We deploy our DMH team members. Uh, to sites. We definitely do that to shelters where needed. Uh, we'll plan that accordingly and if we'll know what another partner organization is going to be there as well, then we'll partner with them and work you know, collectively with them. Um, that's why we have our you know, partner our organization partners manager, Zach, who, who just spoke um, recently uh, earlier he you know he's really good at developing those relationships and making sure that when something happens, we work together. We work together, especially if we're sharing the same specialties, the same function, that we don't duplicate efforts, that we more work collaboratively and and handle the the need you know that comes across. And mental health is is a big one, um, so we do that. And our health services nurses also go out to shelters, and 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 you know and help out in in those services. So once those locations have been confirmed, and we have a you know a clearance clearance that they're safe and that we that we can go to them, we start deploying teams. Uh, to those areas. Um, so yeah, it's probably you did work with us at one point in sounds and uh, that that's our culture, you know, to, to work with all the other organizations as well, especially okay. when we share a common mission. And so thank you. And thank you. Antoinette, I'll, just, I'll just add really quick, um, you know, what you were probably referring to is something called a shelter resident transition team. Um, yes. It's our SRT yes. and they are a um, uh, in addition to the mental health, the spiritual services, the casework piece of it, but absolutely working to get those individuals um, out of the shelters back into either um, alternative living uh, environments. Uh, but yes, that, that's a great example of um, how the Red Cross scales up in the times of disaster, bringing in and deploying in additional teams to be able to help in that capacity. It was really fantastic. Thank you. 
Well, I want to give another round of applause for both of our speakers. You know, we live in a very unique community where, um, you know, nonprofit and government works very side by side through blue skies and gray. Um, and certainly, you know, I know many of you know Jill very well um, for our local, um, our local American Red Cross. So it's really great. And I think it's very beneficial to hear about these regional and even national teams that support our community in times of disaster. So thank you to all of our friends at American Red Cross who spoke this morning, this afternoon. So we are going to go to the report out section. Um, so this is an opportunity if you would like to introduce yourself to the network or um, perhaps you have a new program that's launching or a resource that you are looking for a collaborator on. Um, this is kind of the, the 30 second um, elevator pitch, if you will. Um, we have a lot of friends on the call. And so if you are interested in reporting out or introducing yourself to the network as a whole before we do our um, more intimate breakouts um, this would be an opportunity i know we have some new staffing folks on the call um, if you just want to raise your hand and I'll, I'll call them in the in the order that they come up don't be shy <laughs> i know we have a lot of programs on the call all right so we will start um, with uh, simone and simone you will need to unmute yourself Hi, <laughs> sorry, I'm driving from place to place. Um, so my name is Simone Monaco. I'm with the Florida Conference of the United Methodist Church. I am the regional team lead. We do disaster case management and we also help rebuild homes. Um, so my question or my assist rather would be we're having and not very similar to everyone else on this call, a very interesting time with permitting. Um, currently in Lee County. And so if there's anybody who has a resource or anybody who can um, help us to navigate um, the many in fun hoops of permitting in Lee County, please, please reach out. We would appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Simone. All right, Cindy. Good morning, I'm Cindy Magnuson, and I'm just here to introduce you to our uh, another Red Cross program. We are the Community Adaptations Program, and many of you are already working with us. We're thrilled that you're on this call and being able to connect with other human services um, agencies. We just are working in Lee County specifically, working with hyperlocal nonprofits to enhance what it is that they're already doing in the areas of um, health, hunger, and housing, and we're just thrilled to be a part of both the Red Cross local team, the Red Cross national team, and the Lee County community. Um, we're excited to help you do what you do and work towards uh, creating a more resilient community, and if there's anything that we can do for you, I'll put our information in the chat. There are also two other members of our team um, on the call today. Astoria Avilas is here and Jamalette Santana Reyes, and um, we are just very excited to, to partner with those local organizations, especially in some of our neighborhoods that we've identified as being disproportionately affected by disaster and giving um, populations in those communities um, a real voice into how they um, adapt to uh, climate related disasters. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And um, before I call on you, Sherry, Simone, um, with your permitting issue, if you want to drop your contact info in the chat, so if someone does have that resource, they can um, reach out to you. Sherry. And Sherry, you will need to unmute yourself. There we go. Hi, I'm Sherry Clark. I'm the Neighborhood Resource Specialist in the Pine Manor United Way House. Um, we actually have our next culinary class coming up um, May 20th. It starts. So if anybody's interested, I will. Um, they can give me a shout and um, uh, give me a call um, or I will put my email in the in the chat. Um, and uh, to, if you have anybody that's interested in uh, signing up for a two week training. Thank you, Sherry. Amy Turner. Hi there. This is Amy Turner from the Art of Hearing Center in Fort Myers. And I'm sorry. 
um, offering oh, any type Amy, of... you, you broke up there for a second. If I'm you want sorry. to introduce yourself again. Yeah, Amy Turner, Executive Director at the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Center in Fort Myers. I just wanted to put out there to any of the agencies who are providing anything at all for hurricane or disaster preparedness or in, in the event of a disaster, um, the, including the Red Cross, United Way, everyone, that there's an entire population of deaf individuals who cannot understand or receive information because they do not use English. They need all of the information in sign language. So if there's anything that you want to get out to the population, like food pantries, um, boil water notice, um, emergency where we can find water, anything like that, I'm putting my information in the contact uh, so that you can get it to me during a time of disaster if, if it goes through, and we can put all of that in sign language on our website, on our Facebook page, and hopefully get it directly texted to the different deaf individuals in the community. Thank you very much, Amy. Very important information. Thank you. Olivia. Hello, can you guys hear me well? Yes. Okay, I'm in my car, so I'm so sorry if you hear my baby screaming or something. Um, <laughs> well, my name is Olivia Pena. I'm the operations manager of Florida Alliance Eye Clinic. Uh, we are a nonprofit of Thalmic practice. Um, everything that we do is obviously, obviously free for, um, for everyone uh, who qualifies. Not a lot of updates. However, um, we are now... Hold on one second. We went back to having one or two or uh, I'm sorry, once a week clinic in the neighborhood health clinic in Naples. Just to remind everyone, we see people from all the entire Florida, not just Lee County or Collier County. So everyone is encouraged to refer to us um, and we will definitely be able to assess their, their issues and conditions. Um, evolving their eyes. Um, another update that we have that probably a lot of you know, uh, Robin Golson Garcia is her executive director. Um, however, uh, she's uh, an acting executive. Um, we have a new executive director coming in. His name is Daniel Christianberry. So you may be hearing a lot from him um, in the next few months until uh, Robin has completely stepped out. So um, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. I'm driving, so I cannot post my contact, but I will definitely um, I'm just reach out if you need anything. Thank you, Olivia. Thank and you. drive safe. <laughs> Thank you so much. Kevin. Hello, everybody. My name is Kevin Sarlo, and I am a staff attorney with Florida Rural Legal Services. Uh, we are a local legal aid organization, so we provide free legal assistance to people that qualify. Uh, I recognize a bunch of you on this call because we already have some very fruitful partnerships, and I see people that you know I want to make connections with. Um, so I'll be following up, uh, but just wanted to remind you guys that you know we are here and available, and thanks to very generous donations <clears throat> from um, the American Red Cross, LSC, and Suncoast Cares. For hurricane-related legal issues, we can represent uh, basically anybody um, with, without any kind of financial um, cap to that. So I will put my contact information in the chat. Um, even if it's a quick legal question, I can try and, and get you an answer, um, but just wanted to introduce myself. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Kevin. Amy Singer. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amy Singer, and I know many of you because I had worked for United Way the past 10 years and had the privilege and honor of working with many of your wonderful nonprofit organizations. However, I wanted to let you know that I am now the executive director of Lighthouse of Southwest Florida. 
thrilled to be here. And um, what we do is we provide services to those individuals who have low vision or blindness and help them to maintain their independence by teaching them new skills, everything from babies to senior citizens. If any of you have any ideas of how we could partner in the future, I would be more than happy. And also, if we can be a resource for any of you in your organization. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Thanks, Amy. All right, last call for any report outs to the network as a whole. Okay, well, um, now things are going to get, like I said, a little experimental. Um, so I'm going to launch some breakout rooms. It is going to randomly assign you to these rooms. I see some of our introverts jumping off the call um, quickly um, before I do this. Um, it's really an informal place for you yeah, to talk yeah. about your agency, any challenges that you're having right now with your agency, um, maybe some staffing vacancies that you're looking to fill. If you want to share some lessons learned or best practices, something exciting, or you're just new to the network and you want to, you know, meet fellow um, program staff. I did try to do some themed um, breakouts. I was not successful in doing that. So for those of you who are interested in having a disaster based breakout, so if you're working with the LTRG or Red Cross's um, community adaptation program, the CAP program, um, or just want to network with fellow recovery partners, what you're going to